I mean, I think it's interesting in the parable that the atheists don't understand this message. So it's not just atheism that he's teaching. It's something I interpret it as being about some sort of spiritual change that he sees occurring, which is very significant. And actually, as you were talking about the environmental crisis, I was thinking about an interpretation of Nietzsche which could say, this crisis is one of the shadows coming from this event of the death of God, what he calls the death of God. A, a sign that somehow human beings have lost touch with their purpose or the kind of purpose that you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, you know, you mentioned bees. And in particular, just this morning, I heard on Radio National, there was a story about how in America, there's this thing called colony collapse disorder. They make it sound like a psychological like a condition, which may be linked to a psychological condition. But yeah, that all these co bee colonies are, are disappearing, apparently. I 40% of the bees or something in North America have disappeared. And there was an expert saying that there are no bodies because it's not like an infection that gets into the hive or, you know, that they can then get the dead bees and find out what's gone wrong. These bees are being killed by insecticides and I think that's the main cause. So they're, they're killed in the fields and they're eaten straight away. So there's all this work being done to work out what's going on with the bees. Yeah, just made me think of that and... Yeah, connecting that up. I mean, what exactly what Nietzsche means by the death of God, I think, is a very... There would be many different interpretations of it. But Henry, he was also, from Nietzsche's background, was into a lot of studying mythology and so on as well. So in, from, from a mythological perspective, the death of God is no great, no big deal, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's actually one of the main motifs. What's actually much more unusual is the idea of a God who doesn't die, mm -hmm. which is a, perhaps a later developed idea, but the idea in, in all pagan religions is like of the cyclic death of God, where the God dies and is renewed uh, in new forms. Which of course well, know. personally, I, well, at the time of Nietzsche, uh, he was Certainly there was a lot of moving away from God, but we are now seeing that it's actually increasing people are returning to spirituality more, to religion more, or maybe not religion, but spirituality. Uh, but in the case of Islam, we can see a uh, very great resurgence and revival. And these kids are here from Alban to the mosque, for example. We thought we'd bring him here as well. You know? uh, uh, very much interested in, uh, in all of this at this age. And uh, I, I think that's proving him wrong. Or maybe we need to reinterpret his vision. He might have been playing with the crucifixion as well, yes. the death of God, right. and what that really means. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I was just interested in bringing up the point when you were talking about that, not the highlighting what Minute was saying about. Um, the, the plants and the bees and so on and making a link with the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition with the um, the Jubilee understanding or concept of right relationship and um, the, the idea of the, the, the seven the cycle of seven and the, the need for that seventh day or time to be one of rest mm -hmm. in order to enable um, creation to get back in balance so that there's a, an understanding of a right relationship between God and humanity and all of creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not to overuse it to, to allow... Yeah. To so um, your, your Jubilee is the 50th year, I think, but mm -hmm. the but actually in Judaism there's we leave the land fallow for the seventh year. On the seventh day we don't work the fields, we don't work the cows, we don't work everyone and everything has a, a Shabbat, a Sabbath. And I, I once read um, an article which had an impact on me that said that if the entire world had a Shabbat, just stopped working one day a week, it would have time to replenish, to clean itself. Mm -hmm. And um, there is there is a sense of that one day a week where we feed the soul as opposed to the body. And, and underlying that understanding is um, that that our human nature um, overtakes us so that we take more. We do, and, and so um, 
in the in the Lord's Prayer, uh, and in Luke's Gospel, Jesus goes into the synagogue to announce his mission as announcing that the, the jubilee that is here, and and the, the Lord's Prayer is about um, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us, uh, and um, so so that need for. Repaying, clearing, clearing the debt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And like what you were talking about the child's question, and I can't why mm-hmm. there are two aspects of them, but it's the emotional aspect mm. of rebellion, which ties up with what you were saying, kind of right there. there has to be some, I think any kind of spirituality has to be some kind of rebelliousness, yeah? which is. I think good spiritually, it's difficult when you're trying to be the abbot of a monastery. <laughs> the kind of young monks and nuns here. Well, yes, rebelliousness is it's fine in theory, okay, but not now. <laughs> so, yeah, that, I think that's quite interesting. Uh, uh, when you said that, it reminded me of there's a book called The Mind of God by Paul Davies. And uh, he talked about that. When he was a kid, he would always ask, But why? And there would, you know, his mum would give an answer, and then, But why? And then, Mum would give an answer. And then the end, the end result was, because God's made it that way, and that's that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, yeah, that's like the final end of the question. When you said that the, in Buddhism, the purpose of life is nirvana. If, if you want to make it that way, the purpose of Buddhist practice. Do you mean that, um, that life is nirvana, in a sense, or that the purpose of our lives is to work towards nirvana? Uh, I think <coughs> neither. I think, I think it's it's, uh, it's really up. It's not. It's not something which is given to you. Purpose isn't something which is given. It's something which you have to you have to find or, or almost invent, really. And um, if. You know, if you want to orientate your your, your path and the way of Buddhist practice, then that's your goal. That's the, that's the orientation of Buddhist practice. So you know, you know, this is where I'm, this is where my path leads. Yeah. Um, but it's not. Uh, so whether you want to sort of turn that into a cos, I'd be very wary of turning that into a cosmic principle and saying that somehow the purpose of everybody's life is to attain nibbana. Because I don't think I don't think it's particularly meaningful, and I think it's a bit arrogant. You know, maybe other people have other purposes which uh, they're very happy with. So who am I to say, well, you know, your purpose should be something else? You know, I, can, I, mean, I can't tell somebody what their purpose should be. Can I just comment on that? Uh, if uh, if Nirvana is enlightenment, state of enlightenment, which is happy, yeah. happiness, uh, there is a, such a concept in Islam as well, where ultimately you lead, you reach a state of complete rest and uh, contentment. Um, But that cannot be the purpose itself. It's the outcome of realizing your purpose is enlightenment and happiness. It leads to happiness, in my view. And uh, uh, again, as I said in my talk, this is really hard to question. Usually when we say purpose of life, we can look at it from our perspective. Looking at this life from our perspective is meaning of life. Purpose of life is from the perspective of our maker. If you believe in a maker, well, if there's a maker, well, you need to answer that question first. Uh, But I really think that none of us have decided to come to this life ourselves. We had no say in in how we are made. Well, something or someone has sent us here and that someone must have a purpose. It's, it's very important to discover that. I, I really feel if we are sent here, and then <coughs> what is that? Uh, and, and as I said, that's the way we look at it, and then contemplate. And then, uh, uh, then we can think about how do I find a meaning in that, in my uh, uniquely that I call my own. Uh, in that sense, meaning of life is different for everyone else every individual uh, but yet it has to be in line with that purpose I, I feel to have a restful heart uh, and it, there's an f- interesting verse if I, I'm taking too long but there's an interesting verse in Quran where it says oh the human self that has attained a rest come back to your Lord 
in a well pleased in a well pleasing state, and enter among my honored servants. I, I, I really love that verse uh, because the outcome of that journey and finding that restful state is that we are pleased with everything. <coughs> everything about life, ourselves, God, and that God is pleased with us. So there's a relation, a, a very personal and intimate relationship built. Uh, 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 yeah. Can I say um, two things come to mind when you speak? First of all, this relationship, we have a really beautiful prayer that we say every Saturday, which is praise if everything depended on you and, no, praise if everything depended on God and act as if everything depended on you. It's that same sort of principle, I think, of acting in the world um, with your own absolute intention towards your um, destiny and praying and giving all of it up to God at the same time. This, this kind of tension, which um, I think is what you're sort of alluding to in terms of the relationship. Well, there's two-way relationship, yeah. but at the end of it, it perfectly yes. should match. Yeah. It should if, be we get there. <laughs> if we get there. Well, the getting there is the other thing that I wanted to talk about, because your question to... Okay. Yeah. Uh, your question to Bantain was, I think you were saying that is Nirvana um, a, a sort of like a place to go to or something a place within yourself? Is that what you were trying to think? Well, I was thinking about it in terms of what life means in this question. The purpose mm. of life, whether it's the purpose of a single oh, yeah. life, a human life, or whether it's the purpose of life in a much broader sense and that Nirvana might be life. Like in, you know. Then what is life? That question <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to make some, some comments about that from a Jewish perspective because one of the purposes of life, if you like, is waiting for the Messiah, for the, for the arrival of the Messiah. So what is the Messiah? You know, from the very literal sense that someone will come and bring peace to the world to the place within ourselves that is messianic. That is it about an age, a messianic age, a new age? Is it a place that we kind of find that Christ-like kind of um, existence that we find in ourselves individually? Is it actually someone who is going to come and bring um, sort of peace to the world as an individual? And and the and the and the sort of the, the polarity and all in between exists, you know. Yeah, that relates to the Antichrist, actually, because in that book, Nietzsche, um, you know, Nietzsche's often seen just as an atheist or something, and really he was so interested in Christianity and in religion because his father was a pastor and so was his grandfather, so he was steeped in a uh, Protestant version of Christianity. Um, and in the Antichrist, he draws this contrast between what he sees as the true Christ, Christ message which is something like that we are already in Nibbana and you just have to open your eyes to it and live in this way as opposed to what he says is the teachings of the church which push it as something that is in another world um, and he sees that as creating a lot of problems so that's partly what I was thinking about in, in, um, certain kinds of Buddhism especially in the Zen schools they, they like to play on these kinds of very challenging things, like the classic saying, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Yeah? Which is, in one sense, it's like, wow, you know, I could do that. But it's actually very, very, very straightforward. It's one of these things that sounds completely mm. paradoxical. Actually, it's perfectly straightforward. Yeah. The Buddha isn't on the road. Yeah. Mm. Right? If you're on the road, mm. yeah, the Buddha's not on the road. Yeah? Yeah. The Buddha's at the end of the road. So whatever you meet on the road, it's not the real Buddha. Jesus is God and we killed killed God and in that death of Jesus on the cross we we come to life through that death. So if we're talking about life, um, it's about revealing the um, the culture of death in the sense that that um, that uh, created this again following this um, Girardian insight um, the scapegoat so when we when we have a crisis and um, people are, are in rivalry or conflict 
we look for someone to blame and there's that death and then things settle down, there's peace. So, so there's always this situation of blaming the other. Speaking, on, yeah. speaking of death, um, mm -hmm. can I just make a comment there? Um, in Islam, there's this Islamic spirituality, there's this concept of nafs, which is a almost anti human being that works against you that's within. So, what is the problem? Nafs. Yes. Uh, and you have to kill that. It's always there, whether you're on the road, at the end of the road, or uh, with, Je with Jesus or Muhammad, uh, it's with you, and that's the one you got to get rid of. And, and as soon as you kill that, then you are in that enlightened state. Um, and there's one particular spiritual mystic master, they asked him, how did you kill your nerves? He said, it was easy. He goes, he says, uh, Imagine a dog who goes near a water to drink water, and as he bends over, he sees the reflection of himself. And then he runs away thinking that it's a dog, never drinks from the water. He says, I dived into the water. Uh, just, you just have to take that step. But it's so difficult, it's so difficult to do that in life. Some people, well, most people never achieve it. Uh, but it's that the nafs is the one that all all the time connects you to your desires to the world. The attachments comes from that entity within. Uh, yeah. I wanted to, to ask you about you know, mm -hmm. in, when you, in your talk. You kept on coming back to you talking about your beliefs. Mm -hmm. It was like a very very strong thing. So this mm -hmm. is something very meaningful for you mm -hmm. from a Buddhist perspective. It's become almost like a, uh, a slogan of modern Buddhism, which has perhaps gone a bit over the top in the way that it's presented. It's saying we don't, we don't have beliefs. Mm -hmm. well, it's not actually true. Okay, mm -hmm. of course, Buddhists have beliefs like anyone else has beliefs. Mm -hmm. But it's become a bit of a slogan. And, you know, it's interesting that we use words like a religion is called a faith, mm -hmm. or it's called a creed, or it's called a belief. All of which are terms which, from a Buddhist point of view, we have a bit problematic. It's not that not so much that we don't have beliefs, but it's that we don't define ourselves necessarily by our beliefs. You know, that's not the, that's not for us the, the most important part of it. It's not what we think our religion is, is a set of beliefs. And but it's just interesting for me to listen to you, and it's obviously something which is very very meaningful for for your, your spiritual. Yeah, and I think um, you know I talked about me being here in time, and the, and and that time is to do with you know, for this era that we're in and also in the, the, the journey of my life. And so I guess I, I realised that in the culture into which I was born, which I said was an Irish Australian culture, um, and living in the land, a rural place, um, and again with that Aboriginal influence, I think through the experiences that I've had in life where my faith has been nurtured and I do believe it is a gift, it's nothing that I've done I can't explain it in any way um, it's something through my experiences there have been times when faith has been abandoned where I've you know and being able to have connect and have a relationship with with Jesus and and to know Jesus in the way that I do, I've come back to, and I've come back to it through, through I guess dark times of the soul when, when in a way God is dead, and um, and and a bit like Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And in that abandonment, finding that God is truly there, and. Um, so that, that's faith, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I think Judaism is more Buddhistly inclined in that um, we... Oh, well, actually, I was going to, I was going to Sorry. pull you up on that earlier, John, because yeah. you said you gave that story about the, the, everything's uncertain. Yeah. And you claimed that it was a Jewish story. Actually, of course, the Buddhist story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> well, that's the beautiful thing about stories. There are many traditions. <laughs> but I was just going to say that for Judaism, it's deed before creed. It's, um, it's very much about deed, action, and it's not so much emphasis on belief. The other thing that I was going to say just about the death of God, which interests me. In Judaism, God has, is an effable name. It's an unpronounceable name. Why? Because once you have uttered the name, it claims some kind of knowing or um, sort of some kind of um, end to the, the, the seeking. It's a bit like in the Hindu tradition, they say, neti, that, not that. As soon as you come to a realization, not that. It's the same as the ineffable name of God, in a way, that there is never a time when you really come to understand God. You simply strive, constantly yeah. strive. And the God that you know dies as you, as you grow to <coughs> create, that your imagination, as it enlarges, so does the concept of God or mystery or whatever the word might be. If I may just add to that discussion, uh, I think the fundamental question is where does reason and faith sit? whether they can sit together. Um, it seems that at the time of Nietzsche, uh, when these things were being discussed early 20th century or late 19th century, uh, the people couldn't reconcile these two things. And uh, it was a case of abandoning one or the other. Either people abandoned faith or they abandoned reason. I would say from the perspective of Islam, and this is one of the strengths of Islam, as a religion, and this is why it survived that very tough period of last century, uh, in that there's no dichotomy between faith and reason. Um, because whenever Quran talks about or invites people to believe in something, it always directs our attention to the universe. It's a just look in the universe. You'll see, you'll see a proof of this. Like for example, uh, life after death. And it says, just look at how we give life to the dead earth after a heavy rainfall. And then from that you will work out that it's, it's possible that these bones could come back to life again. Um, and, and if we do really think about how life rejuvenates after rain, it's rather amazing, but I won't get into that. Um, but the, my point is, because uh, Islam makes that connection with the universe, um, there is always, because why is that so? I think the, one of the main reason is the universe is the only objective source of information. Because if I try to prove my uh, sense of belief through Quran, well, you, you don't believe in it. If, or if you do it through Bible, well, I don't believe in it. Or, I'm just speaking uh, as a matter of figure of speech. Uh, but universe is there, ac accessible to everyone. And, and this is why Quran always makes that point. Go and look at look around you. Yes, Spinoza, um, Jewish philosopher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, he speaks about how we can attain knowledge, and he says there are three ways: through authority, through reason, and through experience. So authority is teachings and you know, the tradition. Uh, reason, you know, using your own reason, and then also experience, your actual experience of life. And he says that you need all three of these working together to have any real knowledge. Since well with Islam, well. That's actually, I mean, I get too much into it, but it's actually exactly the same as the classic Indian epistemology. It's a three, three uh, sources of both knowledge, traditional, traditional knowledge, uh, inference of reason, and, and uh, experience. Yeah. At, at the correspondence between the different perspectives and this is quite amazing and I, I thought it might be a good time to open up to the audience.